I am on a mission to get you to try out home automation, at least to get you home automation curious for your home or your work, where it's made big improvements for me. But I understand you're skeptical. The ladies in the tube, they want your security, they want your privacy, they want to listen to you all the time, and you don't want to give them that information. Well, my friends, Home Assistant, an open source project, is here to give you not only the privacy and control that you want, but a lot more. If I may. Paulus, the founder of Home Assistant, joins me today, and we're going to talk about their open source project that makes the Echo look like a toy. Paulus, welcome. It's great to have you. And am I am I totally blowing it when I describe it as the Amazon Echo for home control, but so much more and under your own power? Is that a is that just a butchering of what this is? Um, it kind of is similar, but so much actually more. We're I, it's so much more. Like I would say, the Amazon Echo. I see there's a voice interface to sure. home automation with like a little bit of home automation tucked in, and I see Home Assistant more as a home automation. Like that's our goal. That's like our aim. Um, and so it's we're similar, but more. I would say we work very well together. Interesting. Okay, well, we should talk more about that. So, but just to sort of set up the basics here, Home Assistant is it's built on top of Python three, and it allows you to connect your your smart devices and control them, and it tends to run fairly well on a Raspberry Pi three. So the economics of this thing are pretty approachable since the software is free and the Raspberry Pi is pretty cheap. Uh, I have it running on a big uh, machine upstairs, and it discovers all of the devices on my home network, and I can turn on different modules in the software. How does all of that work? How do you get support for, say, LifeX bulbs? Are you building all of that in yourself? So uh, in the beginning, I was, yes. And in the beginning, I like pretty much Home Assistant only supported only the things that you know I had in my own house, which was like the Philips Hue bulbs, the Google Chromecast. Uh, but the way it's set up, it's like it's a framework that is set up for very uh, for being very reusable. So it's very easy to add new integrations uh, and combine that with like the Python ecosystem, where there's already a lot of packages available just to integrate with like you know other uh, other systems. And so quickly, like developers got attracted to the project. They saw like, oh, well implements like half the device I have at home. Oh, I can just easily add integrations and given the using the Python packages, like creating an integration is sometimes like 50 lines of 60 lines of pretty much just gluing it together. So now fast forward to 2017 and I see a lot of like a lot of third party integrations like Plex, uh, which I didn't expect right away. Obviously, Cody um, and Oliver recently, he, he's the he's the developer of Homebridge which, if I understand correctly, allows um, you to interact with HomeKit devices, which means now Home Assistant can control HomeKit devices. Am I correct? Yes. So, yeah, that was interesting with HomeKit. Um, HomeBridge already existed. And for Home Assistant, instead of, like, building everything again in Python, which is, like, a waste of development effort, uh, we just decided to integrate with HomeBridge and get it up and running like that. And so by being able to... <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but being able to integrate with Homebridge, all of a sudden you can expose anything in the Apple world, right? Like even your custom switches, your anything that's not in, uh, supported by Apple yet, through Home Assistant, you can get it into the Apple ecosystem. Yeah, and I, I so, okay. So we have a lot of devices now. You have uh, Belkin devices, you have TP-Link devices, you've got Hughes devices, LifeX devices, HomeKit devices. Is there a big hole that Home, Assist Home Assistant hasn't been able to address? Is there a big part of the market that it's still a black box? Um, not really. Like every major system now that is like supported, like the ones you just mentioned, and uh, on top of that, there's like Z-Wave and Zigbee, which are the home automation protocols that are fairly popular, those have been integrated one way or the other. Um, and I mean, I think the, the black box is not per se that like there's something we don't have. I think there's a lot of times so the, just the support is not always optimal. Um, when it comes to home automation, it's always, uh, you wanna know what is happening inside the network as fast as possible, because the faster you know something, the faster you can respond to something. Yeah. For example, if you enter your house, you want to have that event 
be broadcasted very quickly. Otherwise, if you turn on the lights in the living room, it's too late mm -hmm. and the person already was standing in a dark room. <laughs> right. It makes sense. And that's why it's probably extremely advantageous to have it on the land. Yes. Yes. And so some things like the, uh, the LiveX bulbs or the IKEA uh, gateway and the lights, they can actually push their updates to us. So the moment something like the light gets turned on, we know about it. Uh, with Philips U, we do not. So with Philips U, we have to like every 10, 15 seconds, we ask the Philips U bulb, hey, what's up? Are you on? Really? I did not realize that. Yeah, of course, that does make sense. I was just looking at all the different components. Uh, it seems like most of the time to enable a component, you just go into the config.yaml file and add a line entry for it, and that module is turned on. Is there a plan in the future to GUI-tize that where, you know, you check a box or you hit a logo, and now all of a sudden uh, uh, Home Assistant is uh, loaded support for it? Um, I mean, that is the dream, but... I mean, it's an open source project. There were a bunch of volunteers. And if there's anything in programming that sucks, it is making UIs. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we've, we've started actually by building some UIs, but we've been focusing on like an automation uh, editor because Ooh. that's something that, you know, you plug in your devices once and after that it just, you know, it's connected. Um, and the configuration of actually your automations is something you're constantly tweaking based on your habits at home. Now, uh, I wanted to cover a couple other things about the project and then maybe uh, a big picture stuff. So two couple of things I've noticed recently that seem new to me, and maybe you just give me an update. Uh, Haas.io, which seems like a sort of like a pre-setup to some degree, a home assistant where a couple of modules might be already loaded. Am I, am I following this correctly? Uh, no, actually, Haas.io is like, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger thing than just home assistant. So the idea is here is... It's, I still have difficulty to explain exactly uh, like what it is. I'm going to give it a shot. And so it's an operating system that you install on your Raspberry Pi. Um, you'll be able to install it on different systems as well. You can install in generic Linux. Yeah. Um, and it's all Docker-based. And so the idea is going to be we want to give you the experience of like an off-the-shelf hub. And so the few things of the off-the-shelf hub that we uh, get because we're based on Raisin OS is we can do over-the-air updates from the user interface. Um, we can update Home Assistant with one click, um, and we can update the host system and like the supervisor that controls the host system in one click, mm. um, because it's all based on Docker. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, and then, uh, but on top of that, because it's based on Docker, um, we also are adding support uh, for having add-ons, which is not like normally in Home Assistant you would extend Home Assistant with components, which is Python-based code, but okay. with add-ons we are getting. Uh, Docker images. And so the reason we want to have add-ons and Docker images is that sometimes, like Homebridge, that we, it, um, Homebridge is a Node application, so mm. it will not run under Python. And so with an add-on, we can just run Homebridge um, next to Home Assistant on, the, on your Raspberry Pi, and all the configuration and installation and maintenance of being able to, with one click update, all that can be done inside HasIO. Oh boy, yeah, that, and that's going to bring it to a whole nother level of users. I mean, right now, the setup isn't that bad. You go modify a YAML file, it's pretty easy to read, the documentation makes it pretty clear, and you kind of set it once and you don't really go back to it until you add another significant device to your setup. But the initial setup process is a bit complicated, especially for new users, compared to like an Echo or the app on their phone, which is really you know, very limited compared to what you can do with Home Assistant. Uh, okay, so that's really neat. Something else that's helped me dive into Home Assistant is you guys have recently launched a Home Assistant podcast, which seems like a yes. brilliant idea. Tell me a little bit about it. Uh, so this is actually that, like, it's something that, like, I didn't initiate it or I didn't even start it. It was just some some per, some person uh, got onto the forums and was like, hey, um, I think we should start a podcast. And then some other people were like, oh, that's a great idea. Let me jump in. Um, and so they started a podcast. They just recently, like, yeah, a week ago, they launched the first episode. Um, and this was just like an explorative, like, introduction kind of episode of things they want to talk about. Uh, but I was very impressed. The quality was good. The content was good. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the next episode, yeah. which should be there in next week. Yeah, very cool. The Home Assistant Podcast. Yeah, the first episode just aired on the second. So 
Paulus, I wonder if you experienced something I have run into a lot. I was a doubter in home automation myself. Then I started just dabbling to challenge my assumptions about it and discovered that not only was it great at home, but man, was it great at work. Like that's really where it's been great is automating my office and my studio. And now I'm all in, but I really am still conscious of security and privacy. But when I talk to people about this, they think it's the stupidest idea ever. Like they, well, I would, why, why would I need that? I can just flip a light switch when I walk into a room. I don't need to automate anything. And I, I, I find it tends to be one of these technologies and experiences that it's really hard to fully judge until you've tried it. Do you have that conversation a lot? Do you, and do you have a pitch as to how home automation, like with something like Home Assistant, is applicable to just about anybody, even doubters? Um. Yeah, so I have this uh, conversation also a lot. And I think the the main thing is people, when people think about home automation, like be, <clears throat> before they are uh, experienced with it and know what it is, they always think it's like groundbreaking, house of the future. I walk in, I say what I want, and it happens. It senses but you. But the yeah. real truth is that most of the times when you walk into a room, you don't want to talk to of uh, your house to say what's going to happen the light already had to be on for example right like it has to be fast it has to be yeah. happening right there and you know the a lot of times actually the the light switch your you know your old school light switch is a faster way of turning your lights on sure, sure. Like a, a lot of people that just start with like a hub and they have an app for their phone and they're like whoa this is so cool look i am not at home and i can turn on the lights great but that's a useless feature uh, because they're, you're not at home. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and the same thing with like you enter your room, you don't want to open up your phone to turn on the lights because the light switch would have been faster. And so right. home automation is really about just try like making small, like like easing small things that can be annoying or making uh, small things easier to use. So for example, automatically turn on the lights when you get home after dark. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're driving home, send a message to your significant other that you're approaching home. Mm-hmm. Uh, One I've used a- is when the temperature reaches a certain level, automatically turn on the space heater in the room to, it's an oil, like coil heater to warm up the room again. Uh, yeah. So, but, you know, but it only, and it only does that after I'm done working. So it, it only happens, so it doesn't run during the day. And then it, uh, starting at 6 p.m., it starts warming up the room. So by the time I get home, it's 70 degrees in the room. Yeah. So it's all these little small things where every time you tell someone, they will be like, yeah, but I can just flip a switch. I can just press the remote. But I think overall it will add up, right? Like all these automations are making your life easier uh, to a moment that you don't realize that those automations are there. and You're only going to miss them when they're gone. Yeah. So you have a demo page up at home-assistant.io slash demo. And uh, here it's connected to some Philip Hughes uh, lights, um, a, an alarm, a garage door, a kitchen door, a nest camera pulling in a, a still, and also media pay- playback and cooking timers. This is just, a, and, and watering, just a, of, the, of the lawn. Just a good example here. This is a perfect setup. And you can also uh, see that Home Assistant is aware of where people are at, what the humidity and the temperature is um, in the house, which is uh, also very nice. Yeah. Yeah, so actually the the presence detection is a big input for Home Assistant. Um, It's very important because if you do not have presence detection, then your automations are going to be based on other like information that might derive that you're there um, because a lot of things you don't want to happen when there's not anyone at home. Um, So we have put in the map and so you can even like if you have certain apps that you can use like own tracks or the Home Assistant iOS app, you can actually broadcast your from your phone directly to Home Assistant, so no third-party cloud is involved. No your location. kidding. No kidding. Or own tracks too. Awesome. Yeah. And then you have geofencing, so you can say I'm at home, I'm at work, I'm at a shop, I'm like, um, and with that knowledge, you can be like notifying, like, oh, I need to look at my shopping list or. Um, only notify me if there's someone at the door when I'm at work or something. Oh, man, this is the next thing I need to play with with my home assistant setup. I just have a basic setup running right now. I've got a few devices in there. But that, that is, that's a game changer feature for me for the, all that stuff. And the geofencing in other locations, too, is brilliant. I had no idea. So that's how you're doing presence detection. Are, there must be other methods to get presence in there, like motion detection and light sensors of some kind. Like So I could just have static sensors in my house, too? Uh, yeah, so you can have uh, motion sensors per room. I think there's 
This thing is called Room Assistant, which Ooh. is using uh, Bluetooth to detect in which room you are in and then putting that in Home Assistant. Um, but a lot of people just use your Wi-Fi router. Wow. So when, Great. when you get home, you connect to your Wi-Fi router. We know you're home. Yeah. You're on that Wi-Fi ID. We recognize that Wi-Fi ID. Let's just go ahead. That perfect. That's I was just having a conversation, I kid you not, with the beard before we started saying, I wish I could set it up so that way when I walked into this room, the system knew where I was at and somehow I could silence all of my notifications. And then when I leave this room, they could re-enable. And that would just yeah. be, woo, woo, Paulus, you are... You are making a future possible, and what's so great about all of this is Home Assistant is open source. It's free to grab. You can play around with it, if, and there's there's so little cost to get started because you can run on a Raspberry Pi or your PC, and um, yeah. it it's just it's a very simple, straightforward setup because it's running inside Python modules, which are really easy to get rolling. Like it took me like two minutes. <laughs> I was really impressed with that. Um, and is there anything else you feel like we should pass along before we wrap up, Pauls? Um. Difficult to say. Yeah, I people bet. Always ask me this, people always ask me this question, like, what do you want to put out there? Um, I, I don't really know. Um, I would say what I've taken away from it is you can have great 2017 home automation without having to be locked into the Google Cloud or the Amazon Cloud or even Apple's uh, stuff on the iPhone. Like, you can, you can roll it yourself and you can do it on your Linux rig. I mean, that to me is a huge takeaway for Home Assistant because I feel like this is a category over the next couple of years that's going to start clicking for people. And a lot of us have Raspberry Pis sitting around, Paula. So it's brilliant <laughs> that you guys are targeting yeah. those because it's such a nice combo. And are you finding they're stable and they're, they're, they're solid and that they do the job? So the, the only problem with the Raspberry Pis is the SD card. So mm. whenever, because we write the history to a SQLite database, which is stored on your SD card. Um, and I think actually the biggest, when it comes to Raspberry Pi and like, um, from the statistics that we've gathered, I think actually like 65 to 70 percent of our users are on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and the problem with history is that if like a lot of events start happening, there's a lot of writes to your SD card. Yeah. Then at some point the SD card dies. Yeah. Um, or also people will like the quality in SD cards is like staggering. Like you can get like a very low quality SD card which looks exactly the same like a high-end SD card. Yeah. Or like they rip off the high-end SD card so you get actually a cheap knockoff and the speeds are drastically slower on the slower SD cards. And um, so the, the thing I see for Raspberry Pis is that it's, it's a good starter platform. I think once you get more serious about home automation, you want to upgrade to something with built-in storage. Um, and so... I mean, some people use like the Intel NUC, for example, yeah, as a small. Sure. Uh, that seems like a good like, fit. Yeah, huh. uh, especially when like HasIO, we have an Intel NUC image coming up. I don't know, I think it's already there actually. Um, and the idea is just like, it's it's a good fit. It's uh, it uh, allows people to really like start experimenting with more like HasIO add-ons and more components because an Intel NUC is pretty powerful. Yeah, really. I mean, if you can run on a Raspberry Pi and then you drop it on a NUC, that's going to be quite an upgrade. That's yeah. really cool. Um, I'll tell you what, that's probably how I'm going to end up running it long term. Now that I think about it, is I'm probably going to put it on a NUC. So I'm really, I'm really glad we mentioned that. All of this is up on GitHub, including the components and the add-ons. It's all, it's all free, open source. Go grab it. Go to home-assistant.io. You can find a link to Paulus's GitHub profile in the show notes for this episode. Paulus, thanks for joining us. Every day I'd like to love you